Well, shalom, everyone. We're gathered together today on the 14th of the 12th month, the first day of Purim for anyone that has regard for that and from the book of Esther. And we are also in February 24th, 2024 on the Gregorian calendar. And today we're, we're going to continue in our read through of Genesis or Bereshit. We're on chapter 32. And we now have Yaakov after his labors outside of the land where he was with Laban, which we know is in the north, whose name is White. And he was over there laboring for his family and his possessions and all that he had as a type, as a foreshadow of the works that our Mashiach was going to do in the third age that he's interacting with them for the sake of parables and how all that ties together, right? Abraham was their sojournings prior to their being planted in the land. Yitzhak was while they were dwelling there. And Yaakov is the renewed covenant times and the going and laboring for his possessions before bringing them back in, which is what we're going to be reading about right here. So as he comes back to the land, the things that happen here, while literally true in the narrative, also are foretelling in a parable form the things that would happen to their children later on, specifically ours and our children in the return and what that's going to entail. So when you keep all those things in mind and what Edom and Esau and Jacob and all these different things actually mean, it'll help you comprehend what he's foretelling in future events as well. <clears throat> So with that being said, we'll go ahead and get started. And Jacob went on his way, and the messengers of Elohim met him. And when Jacob saw them, he said, This is the camp of Elohim. And he called the name of that place Mechanaim, which is two camps. It, and there's one camp of the messengers, and then there was his camp, and that's why he named it two camps. But you don't really get that just yet. However, right after these events, he splits his own into two camps in reference to that, and you'll see kind of an illusion there playing out, which is interesting. But this is kind of like the, the one of those things where it foreshadows something before it happens, and the more you pay attention to that, all the way from Genesis on, you can see that happening in the words used and in the things that happen afterwards. It's harder to see when you just look at the English, though. I'd say it's almost impossible to actually clearly see it when you look at any translation, unless it's pointed out intentionally. It says, And Jacob sent messengers before him to Esau, which means Harry, just so you know like the, the long-haired enemies of Yahuwah from Deuteronomy 32, also mentioned by Revelation, Apollyon, and the long hairs of, the, of uh, what was worshipped in regard to that. So, and Yaakov sent messengers before him to Esau, his brother, in the land of Seir, the field of Edom. And he commanded at them, saying, Say this to my master Esau. Your servant Jacob said this, I have sojourned with Laban and stayed there until now. And I have bulls and donkeys, flocks, and male and female servants. And I have sent to inform my master to find favor in your eyes. So the messengers returned to Jacob, saying, we came to your brother Esau, and he also is coming to meet you, and four hundred men with him. And Jacob was greatly afraid and distressed, so he divided Eth the people. And whenever I say Eth, I don't mean to be um, confusing anyone, but that's where literally the Aleph Tau, or the Aleph and the Tau, the Tav, right, is in the Hebrew. Our Mashiach says that he is the Aleph and the Tau, and that is a direct pointer to things that are his, or what he claims as his own. 
It's also used this word literally. Uh, we've gone over it before. It's translated. When it is translated, it's almost always used as with. But moving on. It says, so he divided eth the people that were eth with him and eth the flocks and eth the herds and the camels into two camps. And he said, if Esau comes to the one camp and strikes it, then the other camp which is left shall escape. And here's the two camps there, right? Notice that camels is one thing that is not claimed. There's no Aleph Tau beforehand. And we've gone over in Gad the Seer chapter 1 about the donkeys and the camels in quite a bit of detail about what the scripture says about those. It says, And Yaakov said, Eloah of my father Abraham, and Eloah of my father Yitzach, Yahuwah saying to me, Return to your land and unto the place of your children, and I do tove to you. I do not deserve the least of all the loving kindnesses and all the truth which you have shown at your servant. For with my staff I passed over this at the yarden, which means he will come down in judgment, right? Yar, like, um, oh, Yarad, Yarad. Jared, they say in English, right? But Yerod means he will come down. And that was one of the names of the patriarchs before the flood. And then Dan is judge. Okay. But that's the name of the Jordan. It was coming down from Dan, if you recall, where Dan had a, he had his allotment in the south, but they went and went up to Bashan and founded a place because there was no room for them there. And then they leapt from Bashan and they went to Greece and Ireland and other places. And that leaping from Bashan was foretold by Moshe and his Baraka to the children before he passed away. But it says, um, and at the yard, and at this time, I have become two camps. Deliver me now from the hand of my brother, from the hand of Esau. For I fear, or so for fear I at him, lest he come and shall strike me and the mother with the children. And at you said, it says, the he will tove, I will tove. I don't know if that, that's a typo, I'm sorry. I'll have to look at that later. But the he will tove, I will tove with you, and shall make eth your seed as the sand of the sea, which are too numerous to count. It's probably saying, with he that is tove, I will be tove with you, right? For he that will tove, the one that does good, he will be good with, right? And he shall make his seed as the sand of the sea. I'll have to double check to see what that is. It's a, I'm sorry. I don't. There usually isn't typos there. But I've been trying to get this, and we'll look at it in just a minute with the next chapter. Uh, I've been trying to do the literal Hebrew translation, which will sometimes make it a little um, choppy in the English, but it's still comprehensible. Right here, however, you'll see in the vowel point, sometimes they'll have a half vowel in which every time there's a half vowel, it always makes the A as in about in its actual sound. And then sometimes they'll, they'll literally just have an E-class vowel. So when they do that, I'll either put the A or the E respectively because that's how it's literally meant to be pronounced. I'm not a stickler on how people do things or what they want to say or do. All of the, the more you learn about the language, the more you're going to realize the Aleph makes all the A and E-class sounds. That, that's the phonetic, that's the sound that would come from it. In English, we have two different letters. 
And you can also find some of that with the IN and how that can be an O or different ones. And the WA can be a U or a W or an O, depending on the context of how it's used. Um, it's the pronunciation that's important. It's the thing of what it's meant to convey that is really that matters. But um, these are all things that we're going to learn in time. And when we're all come together is when we'll have a pure lip again. So people that want to be contentious about things beforehand really have to explain themselves on why when it's not written. But I try to be as accurate as I possibly can with the things I know to be true. That's the only reason why I do that. Otherwise, I wouldn't, be, I wouldn't care to make a distinction. But he says, and, ya and Yaakov said, Aloha of my father, Abraham, and Aloha of my father, Yitzhak, Yahuwah, saying to me, I mean, he's the one that said that to him, return to your land and unto your place of your children, and I do tov to you. I do not deserve the least of all the loving kindnesses and all the truth which you have shown at your servant. For with my staff I passed over this at the Yarden, and at this time, that word is ata. It's not the word that we have for now, which is na, noon aleph, which literally means now. But this is ata, which literally is translated at this time, or like at this moment, boom. So I tried to be as literal as possible, but they generally can mean the same thing. He says, at this time I have become two camps. Deliver me now from the hand of my brother, from the hand of Esau, for I fear at him, lest he come and shall strike me and the mother with the children. And at you said, the he will tove, I will tove with you, and shall make at your seed as the sand of the sea, which are too numerous to count. Sorry, we read that already, but it's okay to go over things again once in a while. <laughs> I'm sorry about that one again, because I, I really don't know. We'll, we'll see that in a minute. And he spent the night there and took what came to his hand as a present for Esau, his brother, 200 female goats and 20 male goats, 200 ewes or female sheep and 20 rams. 30 suckling camels with their colts, 40 cows and 10 bulls, 20 female donkeys and 10 fowls. And he gave into the hand of his servants, heard, heard unto his separation, and said to his servants, Pass over before my face, an interval placed between herd and between herd or it should say an uninterval place between herd and between herd. And he commanded Eth the first one, saying, When Esau, my brother, meets you and asks you, saying, To whom, Eth, you, like to whom, Eth, you, whom do you belong, is what he's asking, and where are you going, and whose are these before your face? Then you shall say, They are your servant Yaakob's. It is a present sent to my master Esau. And see, he also is after us. So, just for context here, as he's returning to the land with all of his possessions, he's sending before him a tribute of possessions of, of all that he has to Esau as a means to appease him before he can return. Something to keep in mind and think about, about what that might mean in in context of our history here, or what we've ourselves have gone through. He says, So he commanded Eth the second, and Eth the third, and Eth all who followed after the herds, saying, Speak to Esau this same word when you find Eth him. And you shall say also, look, your servant Yaakov is after us. For he said, I will cover his face with the present that goes before my face, that after that, yes, I see his face. Perhaps he will accept my face. 
So, and this is what's mentioned in the Proverbs about a gift in the bosom, right? Turns away wrath, All right? And there's a few other places that talk about that, appeasing them. And he was using this as a cover or that like the word for the day of atonement is ha kippurim, and that word for kippur or kafor is where we get the word for cover in in english and it means literally to cover over something and passed over the present on before his face or the gift the tribute right but he himself spent the night in the camp, and he rose up that night and took eth two wives of his, and eth two female servants of his, and eth eleven sons of his, and passed over eth the ford of Yabuk. And he took them and sent them over eth the stream, and sent over eth what he had. It says, and was left Yaakov unto his separation, and a man wrestled with him until the breaking of day. And when he saw that he did not overcome him, he touched the socket of his hip, and the socket of Yaakov's hip was dislocated as he wrestled with him. And he said, let me go, for the day breaks. And remember, Yahushua says that he has to do his works while it is day night is coming where no man is able to work as alluding to the one that does his works in the day all the way back to here but he said i am not letting you go until you have baruch me so he asked him what is your name and he said yaakov and he said your name is no longer called Yaakov, which is he will get what is at the hill of what he's doing, right? But Yisrael or Yishrael, he is a prince of El, or he who strives with men in El and overcomes as it was given, right? It literally means both when you look at the Hebrew there. It says, because you have striven with Elohim and with men, and have overcome. And just so you know, Yeshar also means to be upright. So it's the upright of El, which is not a definition that's mentioned here. But the two that are mentioned in the Septuagint, it, in the Septuagente, it's called the Prince or the Sar of El. And Ye Shar El is literally he is or he will prince of El. So you have that in the literal language, but it is literally Yeshar or Yishra, right? Is the word for he will contend or strive. And it's just the pronunciation difference, but the spelling is the same. That's the point I'm trying to make here. He has two meanings off of one word where this is his name given, but the purpose for it is manyfold. And you can find that in every word in Hebrew, which is the amazing thing about it. But in particular, in the names that he's given to people, this one in particular, or this one in specifically, as you just heard, threefold meaning and all of them true. It is the upright of El, those that are straight if you will that yashar straight or upright it is the prince of el and he who strives with men and elohim and overcomes so just something to keep in mind and that goes along with the context of what he's doing here right both striving with men with what he's doing with esau and laban and with elohim and overcoming so all these things literally playing out in his very life as the patriarch on whom the truth is hinging at this time, just for context. And you can see this actually literally throughout history. If you pay attention during the times of judges to the judges, they foretell the, the things of those different tribes uh, in those different periods for what it's reflecting. 
in the same thing where you have the Reformation. It was typified in two men, Martin Luther and Johann Calvin. And you had the buddings of the Reformation both in Europe and or yeah, in Europe, Germany, and in England, typified in them. Both the rise and fall of it in Europe, in how that happened in the later persecution of the Yahudim that were wayward, all manifest in Martin Luther's very life. And then with the rise of the belief and later persecution of non-Trinitarians from those in England, foretold in Johann Calvin's very life. Uh, there's many more examples of that phenomenon, including the President Lincoln, for example, with the takeover of America during the Third Woe, as mentioned in Revelation, and Gad the Seer, you had in his life where he was a, you can read about accounts of him, I would not always trust what men say. Just to be clear, we're not to speak evil of the dead, period. We're not to speak evil of those that are in positions of public servants, if you want to call them that, or authority, if you will. Um, we're not supposed to curse the judges or Elohim of our people. And when we do that, it causes us to not be able to think clearly because he is the truth. And when we don't conform, he won't let us have more. But point being, we shouldn't speak evil of people, that, especially if they're dead but really anybody, because that's nothing that he ever did. And when we do that, it makes it hard for us to comprehend the truth. Um, if you look at the life of Abraham, if you read the account of what he did, firsthand witnesses of his character, you're going to find that he typified the believers in this country as the leader of them. And when Rome was taking over, it was literally, boom, they assassinated him, made a big bloody mess of the thing. And it was there for the whole world to see, but we don't comprehend these things because we didn't really get that on him, the truth was hinging and playing out in that very way that we see it in Abraham, Yitzhak, Yaakov, Dawid, anyone that's anointed and given the Ruach, you manifest the truth in your life to the measure that he's given you to reflect it. And that is literally seen all throughout the scriptures and history. So... Another example that anyone can take the time to think about is his body throughout what we call the Dark Ages. While his name was taken from the world and we could not keep his festivals and we did not have all the truth, while they conformed to his character, they still had a remnant of evil in them. They were brought to desolation. And his, while his body was dead and buried, his body in the world was being killed, actively dead and snuffed out of the world in history. And that is a fact that anyone can see. So, and those are his anointed, what we call the martyrs. But back on track here. <clears throat> so he said, and was left Jacob unto his separation. And a man wrestled with him until the breaking of day. And when he saw that he did not overcome him, he touched the socket of his hip and the socket of Jacob's hip was dislocated as he wrestled with him. And he said, let me go for the day breaks. But he said, I am not letting you go until you have Baruch me or blessed me. So he asked him, what is your name? And he said, Jacob. And he said, your name is no longer Jacob or called Jacob, but Yisrael, because you have striven with Elohim and with men and have overcome. And Jacob asked him, saying, Please, let me know your name. It mentions in one place that if a man is clever or intelligent and wise, he'll ask the name of the sent one, so that he'll both know the, the, the honor and dignity of the one that is there and the one who sent him, whether it's a messenger from Elohim or his own son. And as you see here, Jacob's asking him to know his name. And he said, why do you ask about my name? Now, in the Dead Sea Scrolls, I don't have it on hand, but I'll try to find it. This account is expounded on. It goes into a little more detail. And he says, why do you ask my name? And quite like with um, what you see with uh, Samson, Shemshun's parents, 
or Manoach, if you will. Like Noah's name, Noach means comfort and rest. Manoach is Mem Noach. So it's the means of comfort and rest, just so you have a context for his name's meaning. But anyways, he himself asked about the one who appeared to him. And he says, why do you ask my name? For it is paleo, or it is wonderful. And that ties in with his name being wonderful, right? From Yeshayahu 53. But back on track here. In the Dead Sea Scrolls, it gives you a little more detail about the narrative of what he said and what was going on. I don't have it on hand, but it does not overtly change what was there. However, it does more plainly point out our Mashiach, who is the man who's Elohim, who called himself Yahuwah. And that's why he it said that he baraketh him there. And Yaakov called the name of the place Peniel. For I have seen Elohim face to face, and my soul is preserved. My inner being or my nephesh is preserved when no man can see the Father and live. This is trying to clearly point out to anyone with a reasonable mind who the one is that he was talking with. All right. But what you don't see here is that that one, that man who wrestled with him, is called Yahuwah. The Ahia Asher Ahia, or I, I am that which I am, the same one, the same man, as we read in Genesis or Bereshit chapters 18 and 19, the same man that appeared to Abraham, of whom Abram washed his feet and fed him as a type of what was to come, to whom it says Yahuwah from the Shamaim rained down fire and sulfur and brimstone, or sorry, the Yahuwah on the earth rain down the fire and sulfur from the Yahuwah in the Shamayim, clearly pointing out, as expounded on by Irenaeus, that the Father gave all authority to the Son, who would appear as a man, converse and dine with men, and he was all showing this to Abraham as a foreteller, including that the future judgment. So, Clear references to these things for people that want to just acknowledge what is and not try to twist things to prove whatever. Because we can't be, the, the, the scriptures cannot be broken. No one can see Elohim, the only true Elohim, who is the Father to which men can only perceive in the Ruach in their mind or as in a vision. These are seen throughout the scriptures, the visions that are given, where there is only in vision, men see the Father, period. And even that, there's no description because his garments are brighter than the sun. And no messenger can even perceive his face. Only the, only the sun can. But moving on. <clears throat> it says, And the sun rose on him as he passed over Eth Penuel. And he limped on his hip. That is why the children of Yisrael to this day do not eat at the sinew of the hip, which is on the socket of the thigh, because he touched the socket of the thigh of Yaakov in the sinew of the hip. All right, and then just give me just one moment. All right. Shalom, everyone. We're, we're finishing up. We have had quite a bit of discussion off camera. Sometimes we do that, and um, it, it's fruitful that way. There's some things that really aren't meant for everyone. And if you're sincere in your belief, you can acknowledge that. There's pearls and things that are not open to everybody. And while we all might want to know these things until we do the simple things that are plainly written in the plain text of what is made available to everyone, we cannot come to the truth of the things that are not readily known and available. Worse, if we don't conform to what is plainly written in what we call the Bible, then we can't comprehend it or anything else, even if we tried. So we've gone over that before, but... For anyone that is interested, 
This is the Hebrew for Genesis 32. I always recommend studying these things for yourself, and then you can see what is mentioned and how things are translated. Quite often, the words aren't put in the same way that you saw there, and they might have reasons for it, but I'm not, I'm not, uh, I'm not of the opinion that any man should just blindly believe someone just because they are considered a scholar or anything like that. Or even if they studied for a long time or even if they share and give things away for free. That's why I tell everyone, prove it. If you need help, I'll share all the things I have. I'm not trying to hide anything or, or force my opinion on someone. I just want to share what I know to be true. And if I'm mistaken, bother willing, someone will correct me, right? But right here, there's that pay noon yod that they say before him, right? That's literally the word for face, like I'd mentioned. Panim. Panim is faces, plural. Pani or pane, if you will, is face of, and then pani is my face. Different ways of saying the, the thing different. Slightly different pronunciation, slightly different meaning, right? Um, we don't have time to go into this too much, so I wanted to try to show at least the one part. And I can't even remember where that was at, honestly. <laughs> um, I know there is two spellings of Elohim. Then, or Eloa, one was with an A and one was with an E, right? So that might have been right here. You see that is a Segol. You have the three little dots, which is the Segol in Hebrew, the, the vowel points. And then the two right here is the Schwa, which is a half vowel. When you have the two together, it makes a... Um, it makes another type of half vowel. And this one is a E-class half vowel because it's the Segol. But it, all of them are pronounced the same way as the A in about, which is why I had the A there, right? Now, when you have the other one, if we can get to it there, there is no vowels over that one. And you have way... Lo he, way lo he, the wa and the aleph are conjoined together for one sound, and it doesn't even make its own. And then you just have lo he as part of the word, the rest of the word. So in this instance, I left it as an e class vowel because it didn't have one, and I've literally seen it spelled with both. Just so you know. <clears throat> I try to be as literal and honest as I possibly can with all of the texts here. But sometimes it can come over, and you'll see in the next one we'll have to get to next week. We're going to read it from this part because there's so many words that are are difficult. You can't just put it in a literal English so much and have it um, comprehensible. I'm going to show you that one, and then we're going to read through it so you can see how it makes sense. But just for context for anybody, this looks weird. We read in English this way, but the, the narrative here is in the Hebrew backwards. So it's actually all of it reading right to left. Verse 9 starts here, and then you go, And said Yaakov Elohim of my father Abraham, right? <clears throat> but um, in the English, you don't quite put it that way. So that's one of the phenomenons that you'll see quite often as we go through that, the more you learn about it. Uh, and then one of the things, real quick before we go, I'll leave you with this. When it talks about Yaakov's return into the land and what that actually means for foretelling purposes, it's to the return, shuv, shuv, right? The... um. La Aretska, the land of your or the country, right? The Aretz is the land of your and of 
or to maladot mala that's molad thaka right malad ka that yeladim or yelad is offspring in the english we have the word lad for a, a a young male child now that's where that word comes from right here but yelad is to to have a child to have offspring so it's literally and to return unto the land or your land and unto that of your family or your children and i will deal with you so it's not just to your family but to your children and beforehand he mentions that it's the land of his fathers and of his children now that he's returning he calls it his as well that's a significant poor you know part in there i'll, I'll let you guys see that for yourselves as you go over it but um ob willing we can take the time read through this and i i encourage you guys to look at the english translation look again at the hebrew go through these word by word for yourself so you can get what it's saying and then think about what he's meaning Think about the history from the time of the coming of our Mashiach until his return and his laboring outside of the land for all of his possessions. And remember, if it's not streaked, speckled, or spotted, it has nothing to do with him, meaning that all have sinned and fallen short, right? There's a lot more there, but I'll leave you with that. So uh, with that being said, Shabbat Shalom, Shavua Tov. You have a wonderful rest of your day and week, and we will see you next time.